first, our, I want to introduce our uh, department chair, Tom Beck. He's just going to say a few things. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to welcome you all to this 29th annual geometric topology workshop. I believe this is the seventh time the Ocean Map Department has had the pleasure of hosting this event. And I hope you have a very productive and uh, enjoyable time while you're here. I did want to acknowledge the, uh, the organizers, uh, Bill Bogley, Mark Walsh, well, and especially Dan Scarity, because you know for a fact how busy he's been <laughs> with the details leading up to this. So enjoy your stay here, and, and welcome to OSU. Okay, welcome again. Um, uh, so principal speaker is Benson Farb. He's going to be giving a series of three talks, and he got his undergraduate degree. Well, let me actually go back. He was a student in the original RU program that we had here in 1987. I think that's correct. Then he went on to get his undergraduate degree from Cornell, his PhD from Princeton, and he's a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, at least according to the math genealogy page, has had 20, 21 graduate students, 21. So, okay, so I'd like to give him a warm welcome. Let's welcome the speaker. Okay, so if you can oh, maybe okay. stick that in a pocket or something and just clip that. Somewhere. Okay. Let's see. Okay, that should work. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me and for uh, Dennis and everybody for the hospitality. I know it's a lot of work to put these together. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak. Um, I just want to say uh, I'm giving three talks and they're on disjoint, as far as I know, uh, disjoint topics. Um, so if you can't stand the talk today, you should still attend the talk tomorrow. And they're getting more and more, I would say they get more and more uh, topological as it goes on. So I'm just like uh, tempting you there. Um, Today I'm going to talk about some joint work with uh, Tom Church, who um, was my PhD student, he's now at Stanford, and Jordan Ellenberg, who's actually a number theorist, although doing topological things. And um, it's actually based also on work with just Tom Church that we did in 2010 that I'll talk about. So I guess um, I want to explain this project we've been doing for several years. Um, like I said, I think we are, the papers are on the archive. Um, so I'd like to start out with an example of configuration spaces. The theme of this talk, um, although I'll be concentrating on topological examples, um, the theme of this talk is that um, a few years ago, Tom Church and I discovered a pattern. We were working on a hardcore problem in topology of surfaces, actually, and we discovered some pattern to describe the situation that we were trying to describe and we started to look around and we started to see the pattern all over mathematics. And so uh, we wrote a paper and then Jordan Ellenberg came along and sort of second generation of this stuff. And um, yeah, I'd like to tell you about it by starting out with configuration spaces. So let me take M to be a connected, oriented manifold, not necessarily, um, I'll be thinking of either closed manifolds or the interior of a compact manifold with boundary. It doesn't really matter actually, it works in general. And I um, like to define the configuration space of n points on M. It's the space of ordered n tuples of distinct points um, on your manifold. So this is of course a basic and classical object studied in uh, geometric and algebraic topology, but also, of course, algebraic geometry. Um, um, these days in robotics, you have n particles moving on a, on a uh, manifold. So let me just give one beautiful classical example studied by Arnold, which was you look at configurations of n points in the complex plane, so just R2, but I don't And um, let's look at, uh, so the symmetric group acts on the space of ordered n tuples by just permuting, of, uh, you think of ordered n tuples in the plane as just n points in the plane labeled with labels 1 to n, and of course the symmetric group acts by just changing the labels. So when you mod out, this is the space of unordered configurations, and the kind of things I'm studying today were originally studied by Arnold, 
I mean, this is as old as uh, the hills, but this is uh, in bijective correspondence with the space of monic degree n uh, square free polynomials. So it's the space of all polynomials, square free. And the bijective correspondence is just if I have a set of unordered points, that's what we get by modding out by Sn, this corresponds to the polynomial um, f of z is just the product of z minus zi, i equals 1 to n. Right? And your square free is exactly saying the points are distinct. And conversely, if I have a polynomial with square polynomial with distinct roots, um, you completely factor over C, and so I can just mark down where the roots are. So it's a beautiful thing. You're, uh, there's a whole beautiful story here. This is actually an algebraic variety, and et cetera, et cetera. But this is an example, and the classical question, which has seen definitely intense study, is to like understand the topology of this space. It's rather complicated. Just for an arbitrary manifold, it's even complicated for the plane. For example, compute its homology and cohomology, which are, of course, the basic invariants of a topological space. And um, an example, a theorem due to Arnold in 1969, and later um, Fred Cohen did this integrally uh, in his. PhD thesis in 72, um, he computed, but what Arnold did is, today I'm just going to talk about rational coefficients. He computed um, the cohomology of the space of ordered configurations, say with rational coefficients. He actually gave, sort of computed, by computed this, he, he sort of, uh, eight stars in algebra, and he gave sort of a presentation for that algebra. And um, in general, there are very few explicit computations. I think for, the, for like a genus 2 surface, the space of configurations of endpoints, I don't think the cohomology is known explicitly, like the dimension of the ith cohomology. For which space did he do this configuration? Oh, sorry. He did this for, whoops, C. Yes, sorry. He only did it for the plane. Um, actually, I suggest this reading. Um, he did this in sort of two papers. It's incredibly beautiful. Those papers are just masterpieces. So I would, um, um, and there's actually fantastic notes by Tom Church on his webpage. He gave some lectures when he was a grad student, but those are actually incredible notes. Just, uh, it has every kind of mathematics in it. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, so how do you study configurations of endpoints on a manifold? And one of the big ideas in topology is that you study all of them at once. You don't just study conf 10. You study all of them at once and their relationships. So you have, um, there exist maps. So there's a map from like configurations. Let me just, um, maybe I'll say it this way. There's a map from conf n plus 1 on a manifold to configurations of endpoints on a manifold. Now these are ordered configurations. And there's lots of maps, so let me just write a map, z1, Zn plus 1, you just forget the last point. OK? So let me just point out, this is a, uh, an actual important thing here, is that it, when you have unlabeled points, unlabeled points, if I mod out by Sn plus 1 and here I mod out by Sn, there's not a map like this. Go ahead, you have a two-sphere, you have five points, give me four points. There's no there's no such thing as the fifth point. You have to specify which point you're going to get rid of. There's no canonical way. And because of that, um, a lot more was known about people. There is a way when M is a compact manifold with boundary, like the plane. There's a map from N points to N plus 1 points, where you add a point at infinity. You sort of put a point way off to the right near the boundary. And, like there's choices, but they sort of don't matter. Um, so a lot more was known, like McDuff and Siegel have all these theorems about the homology. Uh, maybe I'll tell you their theorem in a second. In fact, let me just tell it to you right now. So you have a map like this, and so this induces a map on cohomology groups. 
So it's just a vector space attached to these. So we have the sequence of vector spaces. Let's concentrate on the i cohomology, fix i, conf n plus 1 of m. Right? So you could call this vector space like Vn, and we have a sequence of vector spaces and maps between them. Let me point out there's lots of other maps I'm not considering. I can forget the ith point, not just the last point. And I can map like the first point here to the third point here. I can permute things around. There's a million different maps. But concentrating on this map, the question, which is what's called homological or co-homological stability, which is another big direction in topology, co-homological, whoops, stability, asks the question, is this map, uh, let me call, whatever, is this map, let me call this psi sub n, is psi sub n an isomorphism for n much bigger than i? Okay, and Arnold, um, oh, sorry, yes. So that's what homological stability says. When you have a sequence of topological spaces and you take their cohomology, that the cohomology doesn't change. So an example would be, um, yeah, sorry, yes, Arnold, what part of his, one of his two papers, he proves yes for the sequence of spaces of unordered n-tuples. He proves that this stabilizes and he computes what the answer is. By the way, these are, this is nothing more than the cohomology of, uh, oh, sorry, for, for the plane. Then the um, these are Bray groups and pure Bray groups. If you think about configurations of points moving around, if you trace out the movie, you get a braid. Yes? Ah, so this is the funny thing. When things are not ordered, there's no map. So this doesn't make sense. So um, what he proved, yes, yeah, sorry. It's not that this map is an isomorphism. He proved the group doesn't change. So secretly, in the plane, you can add a point at infinity. So there's a map going the other way. And on homology, there's a map like this. And he proved that's an isomorphism. Thank you. I was being a little fast and loose there. OK, but any questions? One of the things is, and Macduff and Siegel generalized his thing to, to compact manifolds with boundary. But again, the point is the following. There's no maps when you have a closed manifold. And in fact, stability, if you do this kind of thing with Z coefficients, for unordered configurations, for a closed manifold, you don't have, stability does not hold. But Tom Church, using what I'm about to tell you, proved, he has a paper in Inventiones where he proves rationally stability holds, which is a cool thing, for closed manifold. So again, what you want to do when you have a closed manifold, you just have points on a torus I'm talking about. You want to understand the configurations of endpoints on a torus. If they're unordered, there's no maps between them. So you say, okay, let me look at the ordered ones, because now I have maps. But then the problem is, the answer is no. <laughs> so, so I asked a question there, and the answer is always no. This is why Macduff and Siegel, if people sort of walked away. Never. In other words, let me give an example. H1 of configurations of endpoints in the plane is uh, n times n minus 1 over 2 dimensional. So it doesn't stabilize. The isomorphism type changes with n. And in fact, this always happens. And the reason for like every manifold. So when people were studying these kind of questions, like Macduff and Siegel, they knew that like, it's weird to assume your manifold is the interior of a compact thing with boundary. In other words, an open manifold. You care about the, the two-sphere and like a genus G surface or a torus. And they, but they didn't have maps. And so they, they looked at ordered configurations. And then, but then the problem is you don't have this. It's false um, because, because of this blow up. And the reason this is true whenever you look at ordered configurations is um, this is why, by the way, in the literature, there's Arnold's paper and there's a few others 
that are great papers. But most of the papers on configuration spaces, there are a hundred of them, um, they study configurations of ordered points. And that's because you don't, um, although they usually do it on manifolds with like the interior manifolds with boundary because of this maps problem. So what I'm going to talk about today like completely cures this problem. Um, it gives you a language where you can talk about this and how this sort of stabilizes. I know it doesn't look like it stabilizes. And so let me just give the reason here and then I want to talk a little bit about configurations in the plane again. But the reason is that Sn acts on Hi of configurations of endpoints on a manifold. So here's a vector space within an action. It's, so it's in the realm of representation theory. You have a representation of Sn, which just means an action of Sn on a rational vector space. And the point is, yes, sure. Oh, H, oh no, fix I, greater than or equal to, oh sorry, this is H1, sorry, this is H1, sorry. Yeah, and, and for any HI, I don't know what this, actually I do know what this side is and it always goes to infinity, the dimension. And I know this for all the cohomology of all the manifold, right. Sorry, so this is just H1, so now there is no I, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> It's funny, there was a little mark on the board and I thought I was like making, <laughs> that's my excuse. But the reason is any representation, any non-trivial, and by non-trivial, so the symmetric group has two one-dimensional representations. The trivial rep where every permutation acts as identity and the sign rep where every permutation acts by its sign. You can flip the vector space. V goes to min plus or minus V. So apart from those stupid things and for N bigger than or equal to five say, dimension, any non-trivial SN representation, V, if you look at, this is part of the representation theory of SN, what vector spaces does SN act on non-trivially? Well, there's a one-dimensional vector space where you act on it by V goes to minus V. And anyway, apart from those, and direct sums of those, so I'm calling that trivial, the dimension's at least n minus 1. And this goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity. So whenever you have symmetry, so the reason is symmetry, meaning whenever you have a topological space and Sn is acting on it, any invariance you look at, if Sn is acting in an interesting way, somehow all your vector spaces you look at, you know, in algebraic topology you attach a vector space to a topological space, any vector space, it'll actually be a representation of Sn, and just from the representation theory of Sn, the dimension will typically go to infinity, unless you're really a stupid action. Yes? Yes, so is it obvious? So let me do this example. Um, so let's look at H1. So what is, I, I, I like this example, I like to explain this, because so what is the first cohomology of configurations of n points, ordered points in the plane? The claim is it's, of course, q to the n times n minus 1 over 2, and I want to give you generators. So what is first cohomology? First cohomology attaches to every loop in your space a number, a rational number, in a natural way. Natural just meaning it's a homomorphism from the space of loops, from like pi 1, those are based loops, but you're into an abelian group, so it's the space of homotopy classes of loops to Q, and it's a homomorphism. So I need a natural way to assign a number. I'm going to give you um, Wij, elements of H upper 1. So given an I and a J, given a, I, I need to, and given a loop, I need to give you a function that assigns to every loop a number in a natural way. And how can I do that? Well, here's what I can do. What is a loop in the space of configurations? A loop in the space of configurations is nothing more than, you know, you take your n people, you're all standing there, and you say, go. And then everybody, like, moves around the room. It's distinct points. You can't overlap spaces. And then you get back to where, everybody goes back to where they started. 
because it's ordered configurations. And that's, the base point is the standard configuration, this one. One, two, et cetera. That's a loop. So how can I assign a number to that? Well, here's the number, given i and given j. If I'm the i-th point and he's the j-th point, I say go, I ignore all the other points and I film him from my point of view. And I see how, how much he wraps around me. So it's the winding number of i around j. So here's a generator. Here's a path. Everybody stays still and just the i-th point, I move around him and I come back and I assign that number one. And you can see that's like natural. And so it's really um, pretty. How many of these are there? There's, there's um, um, well, you can prove that w, the number of times I wraps around J and the number of times J wraps around I, they're um, either equal to each other or the minus of each other, <laughs> um, orientation thing there. So there's really, there's not just n, you need, it's the number of pairs of points, of unordered points, um, distinct points, distinct pairs. And it's n times n minus 1 over 2. And the theorem says that that's the only way to assign numbers in a natural way to loops. So it's a cool thing. It's not obvious that there's not a thing involving three guys at a time, right? So that's a cool theorem. But the symmetric group is acting as then acts via sigma dot wij. So in some sense, you can see the number, this vector space is blowing up. The dimension is blowing up. You don't have this kind of stability. But you do have some kind of stability in the sense that everything is just, think about it for a second. The description I gave somehow, once I describe it for points one and two, it's the same description for i and j. You just change the labels, right? I sort of, my description was uniform. I didn't do n times n minus 1 over 2 descriptions. So it, how do you convert this? So in this way, there's almost, it's like there's, you should sort of be one dimensional and not n times n minus 1 over 2, like up to the action of the symmetric group. Now the action of the symmetric group on H2 is extremely complicated and on Hn. And so, um, yeah, how do you, how do you, um, sort of try to, you want a theorem that says, you look at this map, that these things as representations stabilize. That's what you would love to be able to say, right? Somehow, like, yep, with one point, it's nothing. With two points, you just get Q. But then once you hit like three or four points, all you're doing is just adding things and changing the label. And you want to formalize that. And that was what the theory of um, what Church and I found, the language to describe that. And, what, and not just for the symmetric group acting, but when you have lots of other sequences of groups, like GLN and SP, symplectic groups and everything like that. And we wrote this paper. So that's, that was um, Church Farb, 2010. And our title of our paper was um, Representation Theory and Homological Stability. Yet it was amazing. In, um, in we hadn't seen any papers on homological stability that ever looked at a group acting. But then you sort of go back and you see like every time you have symmetry somewhere, you can now like ask for stability and guess what, like it holds. And so there's tons more examples of this than of classical homological stability. It's a big area in mathematics, but at the end of the day, there are very few examples of homological stability, where the homology groups actually stabilize. But it, with it, it's because there's symmetry. It, we study things that are, have symmetry. So this phenomenon, which I'm not going to formalize for you, I'll talk about it a little later. So let me just give a few other examples. Um, let me give a few other examples. Other examples in mathematics um, maybe I'll call it other unstable or instable, unstable examples, meaning sequences of vector spaces that we study in mathematics that you want to e describe what they are explicitly, but that's often incredibly difficult. But at least you want to say they don't change as your parameter changes, okay? If you look historically, 
Like you have SLNZ, the group of n by n matrices of integer matrices of determinant one. SLN includes an SLN plus one includes, so you can study that and look at its homology groups. Burrell studied that. You can look at lots of other sequences. Um, and again, there's always two pieces. You first prove that your sequence of spaces somehow stabilizes, and then you want to compute what the stable answer is. Those are two different problems. And um, so let me give specific examples. So let Vn be the ith cohomology of configurations of endpoints on a manifold. So I'm going to give you a bunch of vector spaces over the rationals. Look at degree i homogeneous polynomials in n variables. Right, that's a sequence of vector spaces. You fix the degree. So degree three polynomials in n variables, that's a vector space over Q. Um, um, you can look at the degree i part. So you can think of this as a graded vector space because uh, as, as i is changing, just polynomials are, have a grading by their homogeneous pieces. And you can look at the degree i homogeneous part of, so if you look at all polynomials and n variables, you can look at the symmetric polynomials. So the symmetric group acts on polynomials by permuting the variable names. And we all know that like, there's these theorems, you can look at which ones are invariant by the symmetric group action. When you change the variables, which ones are symmetric? Like x1 plus x2 plus xn is, of course, symmetric. And we know that there, you know, we've studied these in algebra classes. Um, so you can mod out by the ideal of all symmetric polynomials. Except I want the constant term to be zero because um, I don't want to mod out by one because that ideal is everything. So these are symmetric polynomials with zero constant term. And this is called the co-invariant algebra. And it, it's the cohomology of the flag variety. So it comes up in topology as a cohomology, the cohomology ring of a flag, flag variety. Let me list two more examples. You could do the same thing, and this is a, an, a, an object studied intensely in algebraic combinatorics. Did, so you have a bi-graded, I hate talking like that, but it's just there's no other way around it. You look at polynomials in two n variables. So this is, uh, and the symmetric group acts diagonally on this by permuting the x's and y's in the same way. And you can ask, what are the symmetric polynomials? Except for the ones with like one. What are the symmetric polynomials? That was determined by like Herman Weil in the 1930s. It's a very classical topic in variant theory. And you can mod out by this. And this is called the diagonal co-invariant algebra. There's a whole, I think I'm going to, um, since it's a topology conference, I'm not going to say any more other than this is a example that algebraic combinatorialists uh, study quite intensely. Um, but basically, um, let me give one more example, or two, two more examples. Take the ith cohomology. I'm, if you don't know what this is, that's fine, but the, the moduli space of genus G Riemann surfaces with n marked points. That's a sequence of vector spaces. And finally, you can look at the degree i polynomials on the variety. So here's another, here's a, a variety that peop, that's uh, a very natural and well-studied thing. You can look at the variety of n by n matrices of rank less than or equal to k. For, you fix k and fix i. So you can look at the degree i polynomials. So you have a really beautiful variety, the variety of sort of singular, of matrices of rank, n by n matrices of rank at most k. And you're, you can ask, you know, what are the functions? What are the polynomials? What's the space of polynomials look like? What are the ways you can attach function, polynomial functions to like matrices? To, and the question in all of these cases, one of the questions is, what is the dimension of these vector spaces? And except for a very few cases, of course, um, this case we all know and we learn in, as undergrads, 
But apart from that, basically nothing is known about any of these. Uh, very little is known. Very little is known about the dimensions. And let me just say what the theorem is. So my goal here is to give you a theorem. So I'm going to give an answer for what the dimensions are in all cases, non-explicit. And then these are very different kinds of examples, but I'm going to show you one underlying structure that explains, explains everything. But let me give the theorem, the first theorem. Let Vn be any of the sequences above, any of the above, and we'll concentrate on configuration spaces. Then there exists a number n, and there exists a um, polynomial with rational coefficients. It's actually quite interesting. It's rational coefficients, but integer valued, such that if you look at the dimension of the nth vector space, it's, the, it's just polynomial in n, eventually. And you need this eventually. It's just not true otherwise. So the bad news is we don't really know many of these polynomials. <laughs> but you know, what do you, you know. Um, but we can, um, let me make a few comments on this. So that's the theorem. So we found some kind of pattern that gives this. Um, so in all those cases. And so um, just two things is we can get upper bound. We, well, one thing we do have upper bound on the degree. of the polynomial, and you can often, e.g., if you're taking a manifold without boundary, a manifold with non-empty boundary, and you look at the configurations on it, um, can take n equal to 1. For all of them, yeah. For, for any given one, we give you some upper bound in terms of the input data. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I think this is new even for, for in fact, when the boundary is not empty, we get the same theorem for um, z, looking at the fp coefficients. And integrally, you can look at the p torsion subgroup of the homology with integer coefficients. And um, we get this kind of polynomial behavior. And um, OK, so prob one problem I want to pose is to uh, find the polynomials. So now. Yeah, the people in algebraic combinatorics looked at like, the they knew like the degree 1, 1 and 2, 0, but they don't know like the 2, 1 part, what it is. And now we're saying for like, for all i and j, like there's a polynomial, like go for, there must be meaning to this in algebraic combinatorics. So, I mean, we don't know any algebraic combinatorics, so we're not going to find it. Um, <laughs> it's this structure. Okay, any questions, anything? Um, okay, so I want to explain to you, start to try to explain the underlying structure that gives you this kind of behavior. Yes? So, on a very precise question, are these bombs on the degree, are they reasonable bombs or is there a... Um, no, they're reasonable. Sort of in practice, they, always, they seem to be sharp. One funny thing is that um, we've done a lot of computer experiments. And you start to realize that like exponentials are big. I mean, <laughs> whenever you have a vector space <laughs> and Sn is acting, I mean, Sn is n factorial. Actually, I had an undergrad doing, when I said we, I mean an undergrad I had doing computer experiments. No, but there's some other professors at different places got interested in this, did computer experiments. And I'm like, OK, what is it for like 10 points in the plane? You know, what's the fifth cohomology? They're like, what do you think we are? We can get up to H4 with seven points because it's just, the blow, it's n factorial is beyond modern computers for n small. I mean, it's amazing, yeah. Um, but I'm just saying, we all do this all the time, right? We have these theorems and we throw stuff around. And it's like, yeah, but can you try to actually write anything down? Although that's cool. We're doing it it's like beyond our own knowledge, which is what I always advertise math as we prove things like beyond our understanding. Um, yeah. OK. So one of the underlying things, of course, is uh, let me talk about briefly about uh, representation theory. 
I mean, each, v, each of these examples is a representation of Sn. That just means you have a representation rho sub n going from Sn to GL of Vn, invertible linear transformations. And so the real question that people ask and the delicate thing is that what is Vn as an Sn rep? So I'm going to tell you what I mean by this. But like dimension of Vn is like an invariant. It's the only invariant, as you know, of a vector space is its dimension. But when Sn is acting, there's a lot more delicate things going on. I want to know how every, what every single permutation does as a matrix. I have a homomorphism. Tell me what the generators do or tell me what every per, how everything acts. And in representation theory, of course, you don't ever do that. It's too much data. It's n factorial data. So what we do um, here's what it means to understand a representation. There's various ways what it means to say what is a representation. I will say this though, um, since it's for, for topology crowd, um, suppose you have again we're secretly thinking of like Vn as the third cohomology of configurations of n point ordered points. Suppose you care about n unorder, unordered points. Okay, so you, you have configurations of n points. And it's a finite cover of configurations of n unordered points, right? With the deck transformation group as Sn. If you care about unordered points, cohomology, all that is, so Sn is acting on the cohomology up here, it's the fixed set. It's the trivial piece of the representation. The vectors that are fixed, that's the cohomology down here. That's what transfer is about. So like all of the information about the cohomology of the unordered case, it's sitting in here as the trivial piece, the things that are fixed where the action is boring. So this is a much more delicate question to understand sort of what's going on with this action. Much more delicate than, um, and it encodes a lot of beautiful stuff. Um, in fact, why don't I give an example of that? So here, the first cohomology in the plane, we, we, up here, I, I did these WIJs, how many times I wraps around J. That doesn't make sense for unordered points, right? So like, here's a question for you. What are the ways to attach a number to a loop of configurations of unordered points? How do you do it? Like, give me something that doesn't depend on labels. Here's something, just add up all the winding numbers of i around j over all i and j. That doesn't matter on how you order them. And it turns out that's the only way to do it. So the theorem is that h1 here of, of the space of ordered configurations in the plane is one dimensional. Equivalently, the, this vector space that's q to the, uh, that's q to the h1 which is q to the n times n minus 1 over 2, Sn is acting. There's only one fixed vector. And it's the vector which is the sum of all the wijs. So that's how you can see like the representation theory coming in here. OK, so let me make a, um, the definition is uh, probably recalling for everybody, but let me just, the character of an Sn representation V, which I'm going to, usually you call the vector space the Sn representation, but secretly you're thinking of a homomorphism, that's the, into GL of V, is defined to be, it's a function, chi sub V, it's just a function, a complex valued function on the symmetric group defined by, um, it takes sigma to, you take rho of sigma, that's a matrix, and you take its trace. And of course, um, it's independent of the choice of basis because trace doesn't depend on choice of basis because otherwise you're just conjugating. Okay. Um, and of course, this is a class function. It's um, if two things are conjugate, they have the same trace. And this, you, you can think of um, the character function generalizing. It's a generalization of dimension 
because the character of the identity, you have the identity matrix, it's just the n by n identity matrix, and so it traces n. So that's the dimension. So it's a nice generalization of dimension. And um, so the question, uh, and the fundamental theorem of character theory is that V is isomorphic to W as SN reps if and only if you have the same character as functions. This is an equation of functions. So really, I just want to know, like, literally tell me what the function is. Now, what does that mean? There's lots of conjugates. Uh, there's lots of elements of SN, and I'm supposed to tell you the trace of, all, of each of them. Well, you're constant on conjugacy classes, but we all know that, like, how many conjugacy classes are there in SN? It's like the number of partitions of N. Well, it's less than N factorial, but it's still a lot. Um, so I want to explain a way that we sort of uh, rediscovered. It's called character polynomials. They seem to be very little known to almost everyone, including people who do rep theory. We thought we discovered it, and Percy Diaconis told us he knew about it, but then we found out that these were studied by Frobenius in like 1904. Yeah, we were calling them Percy-nomials for a while, because Percy, yeah. So these are so beautiful, I don't know why these are not on page two of Fulton and Harris. They're not in any book. They're in exercise in this famous book of MacDonald in the middle of some grungy, I don't know why. You'll see what I'm talking about. I want to define a function on all symmetric groups at the same time, the disjoint union of all symmetric groups. And it's going to be a complex valued function. In fact, it'll take values and natural numbers. And xi of a permutation, I'll just define it to be the number of i cycles of the permutation. So you write out the cycle form, the permutation, and you just count the number of i cycles. This obviously only depends on, uh, it's a function, but it's a class function. And let me give you two, two examples. Um, let V be, the, uh, I'll call it V perm, the permutation representation, where you take sigma dot EI is E sub sigma of I. So the EIs are like a basis, right? And so, of course, we, we've, we learned this. This is like the permutation representation. And so um, the character of sigma is just the number of EIs fixed by sigma. Well, think about that for a second. I mean, you have like, like one, two, three, and that acts by the matrix. Let's see, it switches one and two. So the trace here is one. It's, it's of course, the number, you only pick up trace when you fix a vector. So it's the number of EIs fixed by sigma, and of course, when do you fix an EI? That's only if you're a one cycle. If I is not part of a one cycle, then it's moved in a permutation. <laughs> and so this is a um, number of one cycles of sigma. And so a nice way to encode this is just say this function is equal to x1. Let me do one more that's sort of interesting. By the way, let me point something out to you. On this side of the equation, there's an n. I know it doesn't look like it, but this is an n-dimensional thing. You could put, fine, ready? Perm <laughs> Vn. It's, it's an n-dimensional permutation. It's like C, C n. On this side, somehow there's it's a, I understand there's sort of an n there, but there's not, because it's x1. There's some kind of independence of n here. And, and let me point out, there's something incredibly special. Um, well, let me do another one, and then we'll see. Uh, let's look at, the, here's a representation. You take wedge 2 of v perm. In other words, alternating two tensors. So you take wedge 2 of v, and you know, how does a permutation group act? I just have to tell you how it acts on a basis, and here's how it acts. It acts uh, on each entry. Okay. 
And so let's figure out the character How do you figure out the character? I need to know what is the trace of this linear transformation. So think about it. I pick a basis for my vector space. What is my basis? It's like E1 wedge E2, E1 wedge E3, et cetera. E1 wedge E2, E1 wedge E3. And now I have a permutation, sigma. And how am I going to, and I want to take its trace. Well, what are the diagonal entries? How can you fix? It's only when EIEJ goes to some linear multiple of itself, EI wedge EJ. Those are the diagonal entries of this matrix. And so when I take, for example, if I see like an I and a J, here's a really stupid thing. If I and a J is part of my, if I'm looking at my permutation sigma and I happen to see I and a J as one cycles, then of course I take EI wedge EJ to itself. And so I pick up a plus one trace. There's a one. The only other thing that can happen, if I don't see an I or a J, then EI wedge EJ, um, sorry, if these aren't one cycles, the only other thing that can happen is I see them as part of a two cycle, in which case um, EI wedge EJ goes to EJ wedge EI, which is minus EI wedge EJ. So I, you see, it's like a minus one. And if you're not part of a one cycle or a two cycle, then like I goes to, you know, if I look at one, two, and one goes to 17, then I don't fix E1 wedge E2. It's going to move. I'm going to have a zero. So at the end of the day, what this means is that I pick up my trace should be for every pair of one cycles, I get a plus one. So let me write that x1 choose two. Remember, these are functions. So if you want to put of sigma of sigma. And then I get a minus sign for every two cycle. So the total number of two cycles of sigma. So this is a polynomial. This is just, so the theorem would be the little baby theorem that we just proved here is that the character of this representation is this. And this is a polynomial, right? It's x, yeah, it's a polynomial. We all, yeah. x1 times x1 of, yeah. What is it? X1 squared, 1 half x1 squared minus 1 half x1 minus x2. So that's cool. This is this theorem we just proved. Now, one thing that's sort of very special about these characters, this is some big dimensional representation, like n times n minus 1 over 2 dimensional, something like that. This is an n dimensional representation. If you take a representation of the symmetric group on a thousand letters, you look at the representation, they're classified, what all the sort of irreducible ones are. Most representations depend on one cycles and two cycles and three and four and like your whole decomposition. Here's an example, the sign. Look at the sign, rep that's a really special stupid representation. The sign rep. Give me a permutation, I tell you the sign, plus or minus one. Well, to know the so sign of a 100, of an element of S100, I have to know what you're, I have to basically know the whole decomposition, right? I can't just say like, well, there's five one cycles and six two cycles. Like, yeah, so what's the rest, right? So that's not of this form. If you write the sign, the character of sign permute representation, it involves X1, X2 up to Xn. You really need to know how many one cycles, two cycles, up to n cycles. Here, this is this amazing thing that happens. You only depend on the number of two cycles. Most representations, you need, if you want to know the trace of something, you better tell me, trace of a permutation, right? This permutation acts in this way as this matrix. All I need to do is to tell you how many two cycles and how many one cycles there are, and you get the trace. So that's an incredibly special thing, and what we discovered is that this um, theorem two, which is a generalization of our theorem one. By the way, remember, so what was our theorem one? We said for all each sequence Vn, so let me do theorem two. For each of the sequences 
Vn that I listed, I'll say Vn above, like cohomology of configuration spaces. Let's just do that one. It's new there. Um, if you look at, I'm going to tell you something about the character. So what did I say before? Before I said there exists an N and there exists a polynomial. Now I'm going to say, I, before I said there exists an N so that for little n bigger than or equal to big N, I said that the dimension was a polynomial in N. And I'm, I'm going to generalize that. There exists a polynomial, I'll say, P of a whole bunch of variables of x1, xr, for some r, such that the character of Vn is this polynomial, character polynomial. So when you plug in the identity to this function, it's a function on the symmetric group, the trace, if you look at the trace of the identity, you get the dimension is a polynomial. But this is much, much more. So one special thing about this is that this only depends on short cycles. So um, yeah, and we can sort of get bounds on these polynomials, et cetera. I won't write that down. But these are incredibly special. So for example, the 20th cohomology of points in the pl end points in the plane, it's not clear that like that representation is super complicated. And what I'm saying is it only depends on one cycles, two cycles, three cycles, four cycles, and five cycles, where five is some fixed number. <laughs> but in, as n gets big, you might think like maybe it depends on like how I'm permuting these guys. Like no, 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 you only have to look. Just like, just like for H1, we had the WIJs. And of course, I only care about your two cycle, like your two cycles. One Think about that special example. Um, by the way, we recover the theorem. And for when n has boundary, so like the plane, that's like the open disk, interior of a compact manifold with boundary, we get this for all n greater than or equal to 1. So we recover, there's a theorem of like uh, Gus Lair and Solomon, Lair and Solomon that say, um, when you decompose the ith cohomology of the uh, space of configurations of points in the plane, like you never see the sign representation. And you can see that in our thing, because like if you saw the sign representation, to know the trace, you'd have to know like your whole cycle decomposition. But we, so you can like see their theorem as just as, as coming out of this, this point of view. So yeah, so the R depends, doesn't depend on it, no, it just depends on the sequence. So there exists an N and there exists an R. And there's a polynomial in R variables. So let me, sorry, let me just see. Ah, uh, okay. And we started at quarter after, right? right. Yeah, okay. I'll try it. So um, actually, I, I want to give you the examples. So examples, two examples that we were able to compute. Look at the cohomology of configurations of endpoints in the plane. Now, or definitely Arnold knew this, but it's 1 half x1 squared minus x1 plus x2. By the way, this is an exercise for you, because what was this vector space? This was just this set of wij's where wij are distinct, and maybe wij equals wji. So that was known to Arnold. But here's this one we were able to compute. I mean, it's hard to compute these polynomials. You'll see why. Ready? H2, comp time C, Q. But I think this opens definitely a million new questions. I'd be really interested in doing this. So we don't know this for like um, replace the plane by the two sphere. We don't know the answer. And we haven't, I don't think that's a killer question. I think it's doable. <laughs> it's just we haven't done it. So I'm posing to people that like compute these things because there must be beautiful number theory behind this. I mean, I actually know there's beautiful number theory behind this because this, there's a whole other story having to do with um, atoll cohomology and point counting and variety. But so I know there's beautiful number theory hidden in the characters of these things. I just don't know what it is. Um, so here's what it is. Here's this polynomial. So I'm asking you, you have the symmetric group is acting on this vector space. 
what are the traces of the matrices? And the answer is, in terms of these character polynomials, I'm going to give you the answer in terms of, uh, you tell me what your permutation is, I count the number of one cycles, and two cycles, and three cycles, and four cycles, and I'm going to give you a polynomial in them, and that's going to be the answer. So, is equal to 2x1 choose 3, that's a polynomial on x1, plus 3x1 choose 4, plus x1 choose 2 times x2. Minus, you can see it gets complicated quickly. Okay. So, in the last little bit, let me tell you, um, yeah, in the last five minutes, sorry, I'm a little, uh, let me tell you the underlying structure that gives you this polynomialness. I won't be able to tell you why, but I can tell you what. And we call this the theory of Fi modules. And so here's the theory. You let Fi be defined to be the category, it's a category where the objects are finite sets, one to n, and the morphisms are injections. 1n into 1 to m. So, so um, and an Fi module, you can do this over any ring, and it's actually quite useful over general rings, but an Fi module, we would say over Q, is just a functor from the category Fi to the category of vector spaces, vect. And you think like, okay, what use is this? Well, this already encodes so much stuff in one object. So you might call, let's take an Fi module V. It's great because you just write down V. <laughs> And then you can do things like tensor V with V, right? And, I mean, you get vec, anything you can do in vec, you can do in, in but what V secretly is, think about it. For every object one to N, I'm gonna associate, what do I, what is a functor? I associate a vector space. Let me call that vector space VN. For every injection, I'm gonna get an injection from VN to VN plus one. So I have V1, V2, these are the object, you know, you have a functor. V, and so a functor is just specifying, gee, it's a sequence of vector spaces for every injection from the set with one thing into the set with two things, I guess there's only two of them, you get, you get all these maps, right? All these morphisms. Now, what are the self-morphisms of the set one to n? Injections from one to n into itself are the same as bijections from one to n to itself. So the symmetric group, so each vector space comes equipped with an action of the symmetric group. See, the difficulty with all this picture, there's a lot of theory of the representations of the symmetric group of, F of Sn and comparing two representations of Sn, but we're comparing reps of S3 with S4. So this is what an Fi module is. So like, an exa key example would be like, <laughs> Vn is the ith cohomology of configurations of endpoints. And all the other examples I gave are examples. Like, ready, you have, n plus one points, maps to n points, all the forgetting ones and all that, and then cohomology reverses the arrows. So see, it's like encoding everything, and the symmetric group is that, it encodes everything. And so, since I'm running out of time, I want to end a little, I always like to end a little early, um, let me just say the, uh, one more definition and then the main theorem. Uh, definition, so we're secretly, it's so useful now, instead of thinking of like an infinite sequence of representations with all these maps between them and like SN representations and all this stuff, it's one object, V. So you start doing stuff like taking V tensor W and homo you think of it as one object and that is a conceptual jump. So for, and um, the definition is V is finitely generated. If, let me not, let me save time by just telling you what finite generation means. Finite generation means there's a finite number of vectors, u1, u2, u3, so that you take those vectors, I hit them with all the permutations and all the injections and all the possible ways, 
and I take their span, and that's everything. So an example would be, um, look at degree i polynomials in one variable, degree i polynomials in two, two variables, degree i polynomials in three variables. Let's look at degree two polynomials. Okay, degree two polynomials in n variables is an fi module. Why? Here's what you're generated by. You take x1 squared and x1, x2. Those are two vectors that are sitting in V2. Right, it's two variables. But now look at all degree two things in three variables. Each Vn above is finitely generated Fi module, is finitely generated. They're all Fi modules. That's really easy. Like you can all prove in two seconds that this is an Fi module. It's just, it is. You just, <laughs> so this, this kind of thing with all the maps. The key thing is finite generation. You need methods to prove this. And that's what our whole paper is about. So each VN is finitely generated, and finitely generated implies the character of VN is eventually, at least for big N, a polynomial. So it's just from this super general structure. So we were able to prove these theorems about like in algebraic geometry and about all these varieties and algebraic combinatorics. We don't know anything about those subjects. We just saw that you have this structure and we were able to use usually other people's methods to prove this finite generation. Here you can see that degree i polynomials are finitely generated and you can see you're like every other degree two polynomial in n variables is sort of gotten by one of these by permuting. It's that kind of like pretty hands on. And then you get this like polynomial. Um, anyway, I just want to say, um, this is just for the symmetric group. You often have other sequences of group acting, like GLNZ acting. And you need to, there's a whole other theory there. And Jenny Wilson's worked out when you have like the signed permutation group. And there's lots of other things, but you can sort of see this pattern all over the place. So, um, you know, hope this will encourage people to take a look at our papers. I'd love to see examples and like these polynomials worked out in examples because we have very few that we've worked out so far. But anyway, thank you for listening. Um, well, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So actually what we do, there's a, the, the question is, is there a version for like homotopy types? And the answer is, whenever you have like a sequence of anything, of spaces, of rings, anything you're describing with a parameter n, like of matrix groups, like SLN, or like spaces XN, like configuration spaces themselves, you have something called an Fi space, or an Fi, a, a fu it's a functor from the category, this silly category, to the category of spaces up to homotopy, or of spaces up to homeomorphism, or of rings up to, iso you know, and injections of rings. And so what's useful about that, you have a little thing saying like conf. You don't put an N, you just say conf, when a manifold is an Fi space, if you know what I mean. <laughs> you can make this, it's just a functor, give me n points, and I associate to that configurations of n points. So I'm just associating a space for every n. It's a fancy way of saying you have a bunch of spaces and maps between them. But then what's good about this, you can now compose, you have a functor to spaces, and now we're algebraic topologists, we can just compose with any functor to vector spaces, like homology or cohomology, and you get um, an Fi module. So there's refinements, yeah, so anyway, so, so the answer to your question is yes, and that's very useful to do. There's Fi varieties, algebraic varieties, and you get more than I'm saying. You shouldn't just ignore and plug in cohomology, you can, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, not everything in the nature will be finally generated, probably. Right. Yes, there's something, there's a way in which everything I'm saying is actually the zeroth homology of some, <laughs> this is something we're just working out now, it's like the zeroth and first homology of 
some uh, kind of homology theory. Um, but an example of what you're saying is, even if you look at like H2, people study this thing MGN bar, the lean bump recompactification, or these uh, stable curves. But algebraic geometers love to study this for good reasons. And this, the, the dimension of this does not grow like a polynomial. It grows like exponential. But somehow we totally understand the reasons why. So you should have like finitely generated over some describable thing. So that I'm guessing that the dimension of this, it's not a polynomial, but it's a polynomial in a certain function like e to the whatever, you know, of an exponential function or whatever. 